welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And this is our my uh, last visual presentation of the year. This is a talk I'm calling Vox Buddha, the languages of Buddhism. I, I wanna actually start from the beginning with an apology. This is gonna be a lot of information I've never given this talk before. And as usual, when I've never given the talk before, I have a tendency to cram a lot in and it's only after a few times giving it that I trim it down. And so you're about to be subjected to the raw format. In fact, I was just moments ago still working on the PowerPoint. So it's that rough and raw. These are a lot of beautiful ideas about language, about Buddhism, about Buddhism and language, a lot of beautiful ideas that I want to share. I've, I've done my best to trim out <laughs> everything that seems superfluous, everything that seemed unnecessary to try to keep this very focused. On that note of focus, I, I also want to say this, though. I'm probably, hopefully, going to say something interesting, maybe about language, maybe about Buddhism. But this talk is actually kind of designed to make you think a little bit about language if you're not already accustomed to thinking about language. And so it's actually my hope that this kind of brings about ideas in you that aren't even part of the, the presentation in that way. And so again, maybe I've sort of set the bar too high for myself as usual to try to accomplish all of that. Um, but who knows? Let's see how it goes. Um, anyways, I'm going to dive right in. Welcome back. Um, for if you've seen any of my other visual pre presentations, a, a lot of the, this will seem familiar because I tell a pretty straightforward history of Buddhism. Sometimes it's about the geography. Sometimes it's about the various schools of Buddhism. Sometimes it's about the philosophy. Sometimes it's about all kinds of different things. And so tonight we're going to look at the same history and development of Buddhism, but in terms of languages. That being the case, we're going to need a map. We're going to need a, an advancer that works. All right. So for some reason, my advancer does not want to advance these slides, and that's no good. Sorry, folks, it's not letting me advance the slides. There we go. Okay. So we're going to need a map. And right away, as everybody knows, I'm using some ridiculous elementary school map from like the 70s where there's still Russia and things like that. Um, but I do that actually just to signal uh, this is a, uh, just an idea of the world we live in, of course, maps and projections, right? So you know, and but to make this a little cleaner, right? I like to kind of wipe it of its uh, national uh, identities. And then even a little more, I like to mute it so that we're just sort of trying to understand general geography without ideas of modern nation states and borders. And as another ridiculous convention, <laughs> we're going to be, <laughs> we have to talk about time. Uh, and so I'm going to rely on the classic Western convention of, of timekeeping, which is about time stretching indefinitely backwards and stretching indefinitely forwards, all mysteriously from this zero point that doesn't exist, right? Again, I I'm saying this so that you know that I know. You know that I know. It's all ridiculous. But it's convention, so we go with it, right? A lot of this talk is about convention in that sense, so. Um, and there's that mysterious year zero. Um, that's the general time frame, And then the general area where this story begins is around 500 BC or so. Again, this is all very broad, very rough. And the general geographical location is right here where that kind of uh, pale yellow dot is there. And at the time that we're talking about, 500 BC or so, that little pocket of what is today India was called Magadha. That was the region. 
And that's where our story begins because that's where the Buddha was from. And so our first language that we're going to be looking at today is a language that is referred to as Magadhi Prakrit. This is from about the fourth, fifth century. Um, if you're not you know, familiar with general ideas of Indian history, this is the ancient language of the Mauryan Empire. That Mauryan Empire sort of eventually comes to sort of dominate the whole subcontinent there, but it originates from this region that we're talking about, Magadha. And it is also called Magadhan because it's the language of Magadha. And in general, actually, what a lot of this is about, of course, and I need to say this from the beginning, and I might say it a few more times too, we don't have tape recorder, tape recordings of the Buddha from 500 BC. So in terms of this language that we're talking about, Magadhi or Magadhan or Magadhi Prakrit, we don't know. And in fact, to even call it Magadhan is just an assumption, which is like, well, they must have spoken something and they lived in Magadha, so they spoke Magadhan, right? So I just want you to know that a lot of where this starts is in, in a very nebulous space of history where we're kind of projecting back with assumptions, but we don't really know that much about the fifth, fourth century BC, India. I'm gonna clarify sort of when we get on a little firmer historical grounding in that sense. This Magadhi Prakrit language that we assume to have been spoken in that region is considered the ancestor of this modern Magai language, which is today spoken in that region, which is modern Bihar and, and surrounding area. So there's a kind of a connection and we know what people speak in Bihar now, but that's not to say that that's what it sounded like 2,500 years ago. And this, of course, is presumed to be the language that the Buddha spoke. But again, no tape recorders. We don't actually know that. OK. But let's break this down a little bit. So this is going to be our first sort of digression into a, a it's a necessary conversation about uh, Indian language at this point. So this idea of the Magadha Prakrit. Well, oh, and by the way, so right now I just highlighted we are now talking about language. And I'm going to stick pretty close to the etymology of that word language and that we are talking about the lengua, the tongue, and we are talking about speech, how people spoke. OK, this is going to make more sense in a minute, but this is where we don't know how people spoke because we don't have tape recorders. We don't have sound recordings from this far away. But about this idea of Prakrit, so a Prakrit is actually a family of languages. It's actually a term used in talking about languages of India for these vernacular local Indian languages. Most of them tend to be like Magadha, Magadhan, where it's the name of the region. So that region spoke a Prakrit. So First thing, Prakrit itself is not a language, it's a family of languages, okay? So that's something to make very clear. This family of localized vernaculars throughout the Indian subcontinent, we sort of have records of these languages dating back to about the fourth century, like Magadhan Prakrit, which is tricky. And these kind of all go up to about the eighth century until we really start to get these languages uh, uh, becoming their modern dialects of India, okay? And this word Prakrit, it sort of, Prakrita means a natural language or original, Pra means original forehand versus Samskrita. Sam, Sam means to bring together and unify. Most people in this case translate it as refining. So Samskrita is a refined language. And so you've probably heard of Sanskrit, what I was just calling Samskrita. 
So you get this kind of uh, uh, opposition in thinking about Indian languages between the classical Indian language, singular. Sanskrit is a way of speaking. And that's in contrast to these local dialects. So that's going to be a lot of different ways of pronouncing words, grammatical, the way they do grammar, things like that. The oldest type of Sanskrit is what is known as Vedic Sanskrit. And this goes all the way back to about 1500 BC, BCE, using that uh, kind of uh, indicator. And this is the, what is known as the Brahmanical language, the priestly language. It's still today used. I mean, it's still used a lot, but it's used a lot for rituals um, and a lot of kind of the more, what would be called Hinduism in that way or Brahmanism. And, oh, sorry. And I'm not actually gonna say too much about Sanskrit. And I'm also, because of time, time's already slipped from me, already. And I planned for this. So I'm not going deep into Sanskrit and these Prakrit languages. We got places to go. So I just want you to, to know this is gonna be a pretty quick gloss of a lot of ideas. And if you have any burning questions, I hope you can save them till the end. This should only be about an hour. If anybody gets totally lost though, please stop me. Because again, I've never given this talk before. So. So those are our various language situation that we're talking about in India, in this region at this time. A bunch of local Prakrits that include our Magadhan or Magadhi Prakrit. And there is throughout the Indian subcontinent, this singular language of Sanskrit that is used. And a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of scholars, a lot of teachers compare this to how in Europe, you have this church language called Latin, an ecclesiastical church language, Latin. And then you have all these various romance languages of Europe, Italian, Spanish, French. It's very similar in India where you have an ecclesiastical priestly language, Sanskrit, high class, elite, educated. It's a very refined, very, a uh, lot of rules kind of a thing, like Latin. And then you've got these Prakrits, bunch of local dialects. That's like your local Romance languages in Europe with this one unified, um, in a sense, artificial language. Latin and, and Sanskrit are in a sense, both sort of created in a way based out of these local dialects. So that's the general situation we have going on at the origin of Buddhism. And again, the Buddha is su supposedly spoke Magadhan, but we don't really know. If you've seen my talk on Buddhism, you're gonna recognize a few slides here, which these are slides about the, the dates and the expansion of Buddhism outside of its point of origin, spreading out, and also splitting into different schools or sects. Again, I'm not going into that here. Certain schools, Mahasamgika school becomes kind of dominant, other schools not so dominant, other schools start to pop up, that some schools move down south, other new schools start to pop up, other schools pop up in the north. And what I want to talk about linguistically is this uh, orange kind of saffron dot down in the south that eventually that school will eventually jump ship over to Sri Lanka or what we, what we today call Sri Lanka, what has been known as Ceylon, what is known sometimes just as Lanka. So that's also gonna be a problem here too, by the way, uh, countries and what we call these things, what we call them now, what we call like, so forgive me if I, so forgive that. But let's for a minute talk about what's going on down in Sri Lanka, or, you know, around this time, if you look at your timeline up there. And we're going to talk about this Pali language. Okay. And again, I'm going to use my, my language very carefully here in that we are talking about the Pali langu language, which is a spoken Prakrit. Um, here, I think I have this information. Most of you, if, you've, if, you're, in, if you're here, you've probably heard of Pali. That's my guess. So 
Pali is one of these Prakrits. And it was a language that in terms of like some archeological evidence goes back pretty far. Uh, actually that should be circa the third century BC up to the eighth century CE. So I'm sorry about that typo there. So Pali has been around for a while. And what's interesting about Pali is that it appears to be an exclusively Buddhist language or dialect. And that shouldn't, it, it's kind of actually very interesting, but if you remember what I just said about a Prakrit, that a Prakrit was mm, kind of like these regional dialects that over in this region, they speak this way, over in this region, they speak this way, over in this region, they speak that way. And those are each a Prakrit. Well, Buddhism in India became such a cultural uh, force that it has, it has its own Prakrit. And that Prakrit called Pali is used exclusively for Buddhist sutras or Buddhist texts and used kind of all throughout India. In fact, it's even used down in Sri Lanka. This, so this is where it gets a little complicated and, and actually this is where I am not like a linguist. I am a translator and I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit, but I'm not a specialist in all of this. There are people that claim that Pali is Magadhi Prakrit, the language that the Buddha spoke, period. I'm not entirely convinced of that based on everything I've read and looked at. I'm, I'm sure they're very, very, very similar. But to call them the same language sort of ignores um, kind of a lot of, a lot of different things. And so I just want you to know that there's some, some contention about whether Pali is Magadhi Prakrit or not. Now we get to the tricky part of the, the evening, and that's that the Pali language is preserved in many Southeast Asian scripts, writing. So this is going to be the first tricky part about this talk. Pali is a language it is not, it, to our knowledge, it has no writing system. It is preserved though in many other writing systems. So this is where we need to talk about the difference between language and script. So for the sake, for this talk, language is what would be called phenomes, sounds, like I was saying, lengua things coming out of your mouth, sounds. And language, if we were to get technical, of course, is the phenomes, the sounds, but also the meaning that those sounds point to. Okay, so that's gonna be language, the phonetic, right? Like where like the Phoenicians, the phonetics, right? So that's going to be, as an example, here is the word dharma or dhamma. In Sanskrit, the language, it, this word, which you should all be familiar with if you're here for a talk on Buddhism and language, this word dharma, that's the uh, Sanskrit pronunciation of this word. It's got an, a harder R, it's dharma versus this Pali pronunciation, which is Dhamma. It's kind of got a slight lith, lisp to it. Most Pali words sound a little bit like Sanskrit words, but they have a slight lisp to them. The point is, is that what makes the Pali language, the Pali language is the way they pronounce words, the grammar that they use to construct sentences versus the way Sanskrit is pronounced and the way Sanskrit grammar is, is constructed. These both point to whatever, whatever Dharma means. I, you know, this is where, so I wanted to introduce this. We already know that, oh, you know, Dharma is a tricky term. But what I want you to notice is that I have written the word, the Sanskrit word, Dharma, 
and the poly word dama, I've written them in our script, the script I assume that you would understand. So you see right here on the board or on the whiteboard, we have the various kind of elements of language. We have phonetics, we have meaning that we don't really know. You know, it's like, what does Dharma mean or Dhamma if we're pronouncing it in Pali? So we have the meaning, we have the phenome, and then right here on the whiteboard, we have the script, but it happens to be uh, the Greco-Roman script, script that we use. And this kind of points to this tricky thing about language, which is that the phonetic quality of these things can be rendered in, you could make up a phonetic language of symbols all of your own and capture and write down these words. So this is again where you, you know, I just wanted to get you to, if you haven't thought about language, this is sort of your general course in semiotics qu quickly, right? This is all verses, so language, the phonetics versus the signs, the script that we use. And signs, these script, these would be called graphemes. So not phenomes, but graphemes, right? And those graphemes, they can be phonetic letters that have sounds. And when you stitch the sounds together, you get da, ar, ma, dharma. So it's a da and a a and a ar and a ma. So you get this combination of sounds, but we're gonna talk about Chinese in a little bit, which is of course pictographic, little kind of pictures of things. And so a script, which can be written down, stuck in a jar and preserved for millennia, a script is going to be different than the phenomes, the sound, and those are both have a relationship to the meaning of these words. I really hope I didn't lose anybody with that. For example, anybody recognize this? Beautiful script. This is, a, this is a language I would love to learn one day. So this is the Sinhala script, which is used to write Sinhalese, which is a language, not necessarily the language, but a language of Sri Lanka. And of course, you if you remember from moments ago, from our map, it's in Sri Lanka that we are talking about, not actually even India, the subcontinent anymore. We're down in Sri Lanka, where many, many Pali, Pali language Buddhist texts are preserved, but they're preserved in the Sinhala script. And so, for example, you get this. This is the Sinhalese way of writing da m ma. It, so Sinhalese is a phonetic alphabet and you can write the word Dharma. And in fact, this is an example of a Pali Buddhist sutta preserved in Sri Lanka written in Sinhalese. Now, of course, the people of Sri Lanka, they, they speak Sinhalese. I don't speak Sinhalese, so I can't even pretend, but they're out in the streets talking to one another in Sinhalese. They don't speak Pali, they speak Sinhalese, but a Sri Lankan who reads the Sinhala script could look at the sutra that I have on here and they could read Eva, Ma Shuttam, Buddha, and they could read the beginning of a sutra. Thus have I heard once the Buddha was in such and such a place. They would be able to sound out Eva, Ma Sutta but not necessarily know what Eva Masuta means because it's Pali. They don't speak Pali, they speak Sinhalese. So that's the tricky part about Pali. Every, as a Buddhist teacher, everybody always asks me, what, is, what did Pali look like? It's a language, it's not a script. In fact, this one's gonna throw you for a loop. Sanskrit isn't a script, it's a language but I know you're familiar with a script of it. So hold on to that. But I just wanna be pointing out this very important difference between a writing system of phonetics versus the, the actual language. And then of course, versus understanding that language. 
Similarly, this is the Thai script. Thai script is called Aksan Kam. I don't speak Thai, so pardon the pronunciation, but the word that you're looking at is Aksan Kam. If you know any Devanagari Sanskrit, the script for uh, the primary script for Sanskrit, you might recognize the ma character at the end or what looks like a ma. And that's because Thai kind of originates from, or the Thai script originates from an Indian script. This is a also a Pali Sutta preserved in Thailand, but in the Thai script, same thing. In Thai, they're speaking Thai. And a Thai person could read this out loud, but not necessarily understand it because they don't know Pali. The Khmer script is a uh, kind of an older script of Cambodia. Also, if you know San if Devanagari Sanskrit, the script Devanagari, you might begin to notice some letters in there. That's because the Khmer script also originates from kind of an Indian script. There are Pali. Buddha sutras preserved in the Khmer script. This is a wild script. This is the modern Burmese script, or it was the modern Burmese script. And there are many, many, look, Buddhist sutras, Pali Buddhist sutras, but they're preserved in the Burmese script. So it's the same story. The Burmese or Myanmarians, modern kind of choice of words there, but the, in the Burmese, they can speak that language. And when they read this, they can pronounce it out loud. But if they don't know Pali, the grammar and the meaning of those words, eva, ma, shutta, they wouldn't know what they were necessarily reading in that sense. And you should know, oh, by the way, there's a beautiful stone tablets in Burma, Myanmar, that the entire Pali canon is carved out in the Burmese script, that very loopy circular script that the whole Pali canon is preserved in these giant stone tablets. And it's actually in Burma, Myanmar, again, apologies, that the oldest known Pali, Pali anything, but of course, Buddhist Pali, the oldest Pali Buddhist texts are preserved in Burma, Myanmar, but they're not in the modern Burmese script. They're actually in a very old script called the Pew script. This is the alphabet of the Pew script. I think you can already tell it's looking a little, a little arcane. But again, in the Pew script, they discovered these, I believe they're birch bark or something, but they're uh, um, these Pali suttas that are written in Pew script, but the pronunciation is Eva Ma Shuttam, thus have I heard in Pali. Um, and so again, interesting that the oldest Pali is in Burma, not Sri Lanka and not even Southern Indian that way. The Pew script originates from a Southern Indian script called the Grantha script. And maybe you could see some similarities between the two there. So the Tamil, Southern India, this is an old script that they used. And the original script that even the Grantha, so this Grantha script, the original script, again, we're talking about a writing system, the oldest known writing system in India, which the Grantha script, the Pew script, the Thai script, the all of the scripts I just showed you, they all originate from the Brahmi script. And the oldest surviving records that are in the Brahmi script are the famous Ashokan pillars. So Emperor Ashoka of uh, Indian kind of history, established in about 250 BC, established these large uh, pillars all throughout India as part of his uh, imperial conquest, let's say. And these are not only some of the oldest records of Buddhism, they're not, sutta, they're not sutras or suttas or anything like that. So it's tricky to call this a Buddhist text, it's not. But in or on, 
in the Ashokan inscriptions in the Brahmi script, he talks about the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And so these Ashokan pillars are the oldest records of the existence of Buddhism. It actually co corroborates the existence of Buddhism going back to at least 250 BC. And again, these are all written in this ancient, ancient, ancient script that is the, the, um, the ancestor of all Indian scripts. This is from the inscription and that those two, arguably it's two letters with a, um, the little dot. So it's, it's interesting that the da looks like our Greco-Roman D, but the little dot is the M and then the last little one with the horns is the ma. So da, m, ma. So that's the word dhamma, which is pronounced in Pali. Or again, it, actually it took people a very long time to figure out how to pronounce the Brahmi script. It's a Prakrit. So it's kind of similar to Pali in that way, but there you have it. The kind of the oldest sort of way of writing the word dharma or dhamma. The Brahmi script gives birth to, or is the originer, originator of something called the Gupta script. And now if you know uh, your kind of traditional Sanskrit script, these are starting to look a little more familiar to you probably. And the Gupta script, which by the way, that's the Gupta empire, which kind of is a successor after the Mauryan empire, but the Gupta empire, this was the script that they used. And it is from the Gupta script that we get this. This is now the famous Devanagari script. It was actually took a long time to stitch this script together or to create it. There it is about the first through the sixth century. This we see records of this. And again, there's a lot of like overlap between the Gupta script and Devanagari until they kind of all get settled and finalized in that way. But now we see the Sanskrit pronunciation Dharma with that hard R. And next to that is the Devanagari way of writing Dharma. Okay. Oh, one last thing. That, of course, if I were to write in our shared Greco Roman letters, D H A R M A, to capture the sound of that crazy Devanagari Sanskrit word? Well, if I just capture the sound of it, we call that transliteration. But if I were to actually put it into English, oh, Dharma, that means law or truth. That's a translation. And that's gonna be that subtle distinction between just transliterating something, meaning just trying to capture the sounds in some other script versus translating it. That's going to be very important to keep your eye on there. The difference between just transliterating something versus translating it. Okay. That's actually kind of the end of part one. So we're doing okay on time. Everybody doing good? Okay, so very quickly, by the way, everything we just talked about was pretty much to contextualize and explain the Pali language. <laughs> so one down, about 50 to go. So no, I'm kidding. But one of the things I wanna remind you of is that that Pali, which is a Prakrit, a, a dialect, it's interesting because it seems to be an ecclesiastical or a just an exclusively Buddhist language. So that's sort of very interesting that Buddhism as a cultural phenomena was so, you know, big or robust that it had its own dialect. Remember that because that's going on down in Sri Lanka, Southeast Asia, if you remember, all of the scripts I showed you were from Southeast Asia. Well, now we're heading north. The, we're heading into Afghanistan, or what is today Afghanistan and Pakistan. And in those regions, and in fact, all of Northern India, Nepal, Pakistan, Afghanistan, 
the language, the language that was used by Buddhist is something called Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. This is actually a language unto itself. So here we have the Buddhists again, essentially, I wouldn't say creating their own language because I don't think this happened intentionally where, where they were like, let's, let's make a language. It's just that they were such a subculture unto themselves that they just had their own language. And so this language called Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit is the language of early Mahayana Buddhism, Northern Buddhism, starting from around the second century. It's kind of a hybrid of Pali and Sanskrit. If you keep in mind that Pali is this kind of original ecclesiastical Buddhist language, when they started moving in, um, you know, social situations or just the social milieu where people were speaking Sanskrit, the Buddhists started to write sutras and started to speak in Sanskrit, but it's not really Sanskrit because they're bringing so much of their earlier Pali with them that it actually creates a new language family, Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. Um, this is the primary language that was used to transmit Buddhism abroad. And if you want to think, I was, I was uh, having a conversation earlier, and it's funny because there's some scholars that want to talk about a Buddhist hybrid English. And actually, you know, I don't know if we're at that point where we actually have a Buddhist hybrid English, but to think about what I'm talking about with this Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit, think about a sentence that Let's say you, you might understand what I say right now. Um, my guru told me it was my dharma to teach yoga. Right? My guru told me it was my dharma to teach yoga. So there you have three Sanskrit words that I'm not translating. I'm transliterating, basically, mixed in with a few English words, right? Arguably, I'm still speaking English because grammatically it's still English and for the most part it's still English, but I want you to have a feeling for what that would mean. If, if the, the amount of foreign terms, if, if they start to get too many, am I still speaking English? Well, even though I might be a Buddhist in what is today Afghanistan back in the day and I'm speaking Sanskrit, I'm putting in so many Pali Buddhist terms that I might as well be speaking a different language. And that's called Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. That's gonna be important. By the way, those two Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit in the North, Pali in the South, that's a pretty clear divide there. Now I wanna talk about this beautiful region here. What is today Pakistan, part of Afghanistan, the Northern parts there. This is a region of the world that back in the first through the sixth century of the common era was known as Gandhara. This is uh, what you're looking at here is the Bamiyan Valley in modern day Afghanistan. And on the left, on the left, you in the mountain, you might be able to see a very large, uh, like a carving or it's like a carved out. Well, that's this, which is the giant Buddha of Bamiyan. So this is just to give you a flavor for what's going on in Gandharan Buddhism. These mammoth Buddhist carvings, a pretty wild form of Buddhism. Please see some of my other uh, visual presentations if you want to know about Gandharan Buddhism. This is interesting though. I always have to mention this, especially when it comes to language. This, what you're looking at is actually a Gandharan, or it's tricky, but essentially a Gandharan coin. And that's the Buddha on a gold coin, probably from the first, second century common era. And what you're looking at is the oldest known image of a Buddha ever. And it's on a coin. <laughs> fascinating. But what's even more fascinating than the image of the Buddha on a gold coin is that written in Greek, in Greek on the side is B-O-D-D-O, Buddha. 
So that's the Greek transliteration of the word Buddha on a coin. And it was found in this region of Afghanistan. Fascinating. So that's just sort of a, a, a little, just one little thing of how Buddhism and language mixes in really, really wild, interesting ways. But actually, when we look into the archaeological history of Gandhara, in the, I think it was in the mid 20th century, it might have even been a little bit later than that, there was a discovery, discovery, these things are always tricky, but there was a discovery of a large cache or a large trove of Buddhist manuscripts. And they were written in this language. We don't, were written in a script. And over time, we came to realize that these Buddhist uh, manuscripts were, um, gotta, we gotta be careful. So they're in a language called Gandhari. They were, they are from the, the, bar, the birch bark uh, manuscript I just showed you is from about the first or the, to the third century. These manuscripts are, the Gandharan texts are the oldest Buddhist manuscripts ever discovered. So they're from this kind of region of Afghanistan. They also happen to be the oldest Indian manuscripts. So India itself, like many cultures, has a, a habit, I don't wanna say it's a bad habit, it's a habit that many cultures have, which is basically forgetting about their past and reusing it. If it's a piece of paper, I'm gonna reuse it. If it's a building, tear it down and build a new building. And so in archeological and especially manuscript evidence from India is very hard to come by because it's a living, breathing culture always. And so it, it evolves that way. Whereas Gandhara was this kind of, kingdom, a Buddhist kingdom at that for a while. And then it had its heyday and then it sort of like closed up. And so these Gandhari manuscripts were actually discovered inside a large um, earthen jar. So what's interesting about these is that they are Buddhist sutras and most of them, by the way, are the Pranya Paramita sutras, famously like the Vajra Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, but they are written in Gandhari, this language of Gandahar, using something called the Karoshti script. So this is where it starts to get really complicated. And I'm not gonna to spend too much time here because it's so complicated, but there is the script, this beautiful script called Karoshti, which actually seems to be connected to Aramaic. This is an example of it. It's a very cursive-y, flowy type of script and these Buddhist texts that were discovered in Gandhara, they're written in Karosti, but what's interesting is that what, what's being written in Karosti is not transliterated Pali or Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. It's the Gandhari language. So this is going to be sort of one of our first mm, kind of peaks at a culture, Gandharan culture, that is getting their Buddhism, translating it into their own language, and then putting that into writing using a script like Karosti. So again, I know I'm moving quickly through all of this, so I hope I just want to plant nice ideas in that way. So it is from Gandhara and kind of that region of Afghanistan, Pakistan, that Buddhism heads into China or just East Asia, right? And that middle part right here that I'm highlighting, that's sort of the Gobi Desert. And there's an, a region of the Gobi Desert in the Gansu province called Dunhuang. And Dunhuang is sort of the heart of what is known as the Silk Road, this trading route that was going between well, ultimately it was, it was going essentially between Rome and the capital of China, but I, I digress. This Silk Road and in particular, this region called Dunhuang was really, really active from about the second century BC all the way to about the 10th century common era. This is where you find the famous 
Thousand Buddha Grottoes, the Caves of the Thousand Buddhas. And in the 19 teens or 20s, I forget, there was a large cache or trove of Buddhist text discovered there, uh, sealed behind a, uh, a wall. They, a lot of uh, theories about why the, all these sutras were sealed behind this wall. They were discovered by a Hungarian archaeologist uh, named uh, Stein, Arl Stein. Anyways, there were this huge trove of Buddhist sutras written in all kinds of texts, per preserving all kinds of languages, all right? Languages I can't even get into, a language like Tungwit, a language like Sogdian, which is, there's an area in Central Asia called Sogdiana. They spoke Sogdian. There is a tribal group named the Uyghur, which are still very much alive today. Um, and there is a language that they speak, Uyghur. And so there are Buddhist texts discovered in that place, Dunhuang, that are, in terms of the language, they are Buddhist sutras and Buddhist texts in the Uyghur language, Sogdian, Tanguit, Gandharan, you name it. But remember, those were all languages I just said. So there was one major thing going on in Central Asia, primarily in Dunhuang, and that was the trans both, the transliteration and translation of Buddhist texts in Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit, in Pali, in Uyghur, in Sogdian, you name it, in all of them, there was this major effort to translate all of these sutras in all of these languages, in all of these different scripts, <laughs> to translate them using the Han script. You'd call it Chinese, but it's way more accurate to just call it the Han script. And I'll tell you why that is. So this is our little digression into, again, what you might call Chinese. So the Han script in Mandarin, Mandarin language, right, is pronounced the Han Zi. And that's what those two characters actually say. They are pronounced in modern Mandarin, Han Zi or Han Zi. And this is, of course, what you know of as Sanskrit, or sorry, sorry Chinese. But of course, Chinese, that's like a kind of a French word. The word China is kind of a French, like it gets complicated. The Chinese don't call themselves Chinese. And it's, you know, that's a kind of a weird word to even use. Whereas the Han, which are a, I don't know what you would call, I mean, it's a people. I don't know what kind of, what, like, um, what the right word would be for that, but it is a, a Chinese group of people named the Han. They are not the only Chinese people, but they came to dominance during the Han Dynasty. So the Han people were at the head of the Han Dynasty. And although they didn't invent this type of writing system, it's called the Han system or the Han Zi. And Zi means like a character ideogram or something like that. And of course, oh, by the way, so just to give you a quick history, the Han script dates at, at least to 1200 BC maybe even much before that. But from around 1200 BC, we have these ancient uh, bone carvings. They're carved in stone, mainly in bone though. And so you get something like this. And so that's the origin of the Han script. Again, what you might call Chinese. The origin of it are these bone inscriptions. And you can trace the morphology or the genesis of modern Chinese characters or modern Han characters from these. If you don't know, just very quickly, what makes, what makes translating things into Chinese and out of Chinese, of course, is that Chinese is not a phonetic language or it's not exclusively a phonetic language. It's a pictographic language, but it's even more complicated than that. So for example, right there, you have the character Han. 
but it's only pronounced Han in modern Mandarin. So that's complicated in terms of how these characters, ideograms, how they're pronounced. But even just as signs, remember graphemes, just as signs, Chinese is tricky. Almost all Chinese characters have two parts to them. A meaning part, which would be what is called the radical. And so like right here on the side, this is little th three little drops of water. And indeed that's the water radical. So you'll, you'll see, and in fact, even in this talk, you're gonna see another character in a little while where it has these little dots going one, two, and then blink, like a little splash. So that little, those three droplets are actually the, the radical. So it's not a character unto itself, it's a radical portion and it provides the meaning of a character. The other side of this, and it's not always the right and the left, it could be sometimes the top part, but it gets complicated. But the other side of this character is the sound part of it. It's the more of a phonetic quality. And so the Han is actually originally, before it was the name of a people or the name of a script, what the Han, what this character referred to was the Han River. And so the meaning of this character comes from the water portion of it. And then the sound comes from the other portion. And so when you are working with Chinese characters or Han, Hanzi, Han characters, when you see that your mind goes, huh, that's the water thing that is pronounced kind of like Han. Oh yeah, that's the river Han. <laughs> so there's actually, so people think that, or some people think that Chinese characters are entirely pictographic. They're not. Actually, most Chinese characters have a meaning portion and a sound portion. And the two work together to create the logos or the, the meaning of the word. So in other words, how could you possibly translate Dharma into Han characters, Hanzi, right? Well, and by the way, I, this is sort of, I do translate uh, things into Chinese. And so this was the portion of the talk that I had to narrow way down. <laughs> because of course, when you know a lot about something, you get excited. So just to share with you this, how did the Chinese translate the word Dharma? Well, just like we have done in English, when we were not sure what Dharma meant, or when we're not sure what it means, we in English, we don't translate it, we transliterate it. So we just keep saying the word Dharma. Well, the Chinese did the same thing. They started playing around with these different two character combinations. And these are the, again, modern Mandarin pronunciation of these characters. So the first two character combination is da mo, tan mu, or tan mo. <laughs> now in modern Mandarin, these characters are pronounced the way I have it on the side, but actually in the medieval dialect, these would have been pronounced much closer to dama or damo, damu, damo. So the, the T would have been a harder dental, would have been a D or I guess a softer dental. But the idea is, is that the point is the Chinese originally, they didn't know what Dharma was or meant or whatever. So they were just using characters that they have, but only to capture the sound. So when you see these characters on the side, it's not about what they mean, it's about how they sound. This goes on for a few hundred years where the Chinese are just transliterating a lot of the Sanskrit ideas until they eventually settle upon this single Chinese, or sorry, single Han character. Now this character is pronounced fa, nothing to do with dhamma, dharma, nothing to do with the sound. The character 
means law or principle, which is how the Chinese translated the idea of Dharma. And indeed, in many Buddhist texts, especially Buddhist sutras that I translate, you'll see both. Sometimes they transliterate it. Sometimes they use the single character fa. It really depends. So I hope that makes sense. By the way, what you're looking at here is a translated, not transliterated, but translated Diamond Sutra or Vajra Sutra, as it's called, the Vajra Panyaparamita Sutra. And this, of course, in terms of language, is a very important document. This is a scroll that was discovered in Dunhuang, that Central Asian location I was telling you about, where all these different languages got translated into Chinese. They discovered this scroll, a translation of the Vajrapanyaparamita Sutra. But what makes this particular scroll very interesting is that it's a block printed version of this scroll. And what's even more interesting about this scroll is that it actually has a date on it. Now, it's of course, it's in the Chinese calendar system and actually not even the Chinese calendar system. It's in some whole other, Chinese, uh, other calendar system. But the date that's on it corresponds to the Western year of 868, common era. So this is important because there's a very, very big deal made about the Gutenberg Bible because it was printed with movable type. That was in like the 1500s. <laughs> that was like, like yesterday. In 868, the Chinese were already block printing. Now, the reason why the Gutenberg Bible and that type is so like, woo, is because it's individual letters versus these were actually large blocks that had whole sections of the sutra. But the point remains the same, which is that in Dun, at Dunhuang, they were mass producing copies of the Vajrapranyaparamita Sutra using ink blocks. So they stamp it in ink, stamp it on paper. So interesting as far as the history of language goes. Another beautiful sutra. This one's from uh, kind of uh, the Tang Dynasty, kind of, uh, I, I don't want to use this word China, because it was at that time, it was the Tang Dynasty. So that was the Tang, but a beautiful representation of, of the Chinese translating Buddhist texts. Now I need to introduce you to a really interesting script, also very um, uh, popular at that place, Dunhuang. So this is a script called Sidham. Very, very special script if you study Buddhism. This script is a kind of a mysterious script. Um, it's used to write Sanskrit. So just like Devanagari and a variety of other scripts that can be used to write Sanskrit, this is one of them. And this particular script not Devanagari, not a bunch of the other scripts I mentioned, but Siddham is the Indian Sanskrit script that makes its way to China. This is important. So here, by the way, this is the word Dhamma, but in the Siddham script now. And next to that, now here, this is a beautiful um, representation of I can't tell you how important these types of documents are because what this is, and I don't know if you can tell because you might not know Siddham or Chinese, but it is a mantra. It's an incantation written in Siddham with the equivalent Chinese or Han characters next to it. This is like the Rosetta Stone of like Chinese and Chinese Buddhism in a way. So what's interesting about this is that because like you can take, so it says on the far right-hand column, it says, and everybody's face is in the way, so I can't actually read it for you, but it basically says like the great Buddha mantra, 
it says all Tathagata's uh, Vajra shield Durrani. If I'm, if I'm reading the Chinese right. But then next to that is the first line of Siddham. And the very, very, very top character is the Om or the Ah. And then the Chinese character to the left of that is a character that we now know is pronounced Ah, or at least it was back in the medieval period. So it's a beautiful thing where we can actually reconstruct what medieval Chinese characters, medieval Han characters sounded like because we have these amazing um, um, corollaries. So just to share with you a little bit of that, and by the way, Sidham's gonna come back in a second. So hold on. Oh, I gotta move everybody out of the way so I can see. Okay. So of course, Buddhism sweeps over China, a particular school, the Dharmaguptaka school, which is represented in black. They became kind of the foremost school of Buddhism um, in China for a while. And by the way, it's just for context. Remember at the opening of this presentation, I told you about all the, the Thai script and the Burmese script and all those scripts. Well, it's in terms of our chronology of my presentation, now is when those things were being written. So I told you about them a long time ago, but it's actually not until now that that's actually happening, if you, if you can remember that far back. Uh, that purple dot is the capital of China. Uh, it's kind of important to how Buddhism spread throughout the rest of East Asia. That dot represents the origin of Zen Buddhism or Chan Buddhism in the South. I'm reusing slides here, so a lot of this I can't kind of get around in that sense. Um, by the way, of course, Mandarin, the, the, the way that I've been pronouncing these Chinese characters and the, the type of Chinese that I speak is Mandarin. It's kind of more of a Northern dialect, whereas Cantonese, which is spoken by way more Chinese or way more Cantonese, is uh, kind of from the South there, just FYI. It's the more very, very Chinese type of Buddhism coming out of the capital of China that goes to Korea. And I had to jettison a whole portion of this talk about the Korean language, but I just want you to know that the Koreans, of course, they have a language. They speak phonetically a certain way, but the oldest Buddhist records in Korea, they're preserved in Han characters. And so this is actually where it's gonna start getting tricky, but it's why I've kind of been wanting to insist on calling them Han characters and not Chinese. Because the idea is, is that those same pictographs, those same ideograms, they are read and understood or were read and understood by the Koreans or Shilla was the name of the uh, kingdom at this time or empire, but the Koreans, they, they could read the Chinese characters or the Han characters, but they pronounced each of them in a Korean way. Same with the Japanese. So it's from Korea that Buddhism makes its way to Japan. And of course the Japanese have a language, but they use Han characters. They use Chinese characters, but they pronounce them in a Japanese way. I'm gonna get back to Japan in a second. We just have one quick stop to make. So while the Zen tradition in China is going off, around getting right towards the year 700, late 600s, it's the rise of the Tibetan empire. And in particular, this idea of Tibetan, Tibetan culture, Tibetan language. But Tibet, like everywhere else, it's at, it's not just one language, it's actually a family of languages that we would call Tibetan, but it's actually the Tibetic languages. And there is this Tibetan script. The story of this script is that it's attributed to this uh, minister, a minister of state named uh, maybe Thanmi Sambutta. I don't know how to pronounce it accurately, but in the seventh century, so the mid 600s, this minister was actually sent to India to study writing. He studied Devanagari, he studied all, all the different scripts. And then he, tradition says, 
created out of what he learned a script exclusively for the Tibetan language or to Tibetan languages. Now the thing up top, it says Om Mani Padmi Hom. But what I want to show you is, is this is the Tibetan script and that phonetically. So remember the minister I just told the Tibetan minister went to India. So he studied phonetic sound based writing systems. He brought back, and so what that says is actually this Tibetan word, chuo. But that's how the Tibetans say Dharma. So the Tibetan, and in Tibetan script, it doesn't, that, that Tibetan there does not say Dharma in Tibetan script. It actually says chuo, which is the Tibetan word for Dharma. Okay. So I just want to make that clear that Tibetan is its own, its own language, own script, its own world, right? Okay, one, this is it. And then we can open it up, questions, answers, ideas, and all that. One last thing. So here's kind of a, a snapshot of the Buddhist world in the mid ninth century. Buddhism in Afghanistan and Pakistan, down in Southeast Asia, all throughout China, Korea, Japan. And to end this talk, and, and again, I've trimmed so much out of this talk. So I've left out so much, but I need to say a few beautiful words about the Japanese language. So the Japanese language, of course, Japanese, there have been occupants of the archipelago for a long, long time. There's actually a variety of, of dialects that are from Hokkaido, Northern Japan, all of that. But in general, there is this Japanese language, <clears throat> again, spoken language, but they use the Han script or the Han writing system. In fact, if you know this word kanji, that's just the way the Japanese pronounce those two characters, those two ideograms. So the word han, the Japanese say kan. And instead of z, they say j, kanji. So they're just pronouncing the Chinese differently. It, it's so different though, you couldn't call Japanese a dialect. No, it's so different, but they use all the Chinese Han characters, they just pronounce them all very differently. And what, what makes studying Japanese very hard is that unlike Chinese, where each character has a monosyllabic sound, one syllable sound, in Japanese, a character can be multisyllabic. So it gets really crazy really quickly, but then just to make it crazier, they have an additional kana syllabary uh, or kana, um, uh, in particular, this one called hiragana. There is also katakana, but in general, it's just called kana. And it's a phonetic syllabary that looks like this. So right when you see those, you might say, if you don't know Chinese or Japanese, you might say, but those are, those are characters. They're not though. They are actually, they originate from a, you know what? The, the thing I showed you with the Sidham, with the Chinese characters, those Chinese characters are these very, very special Hanza, Chinese characters that were chosen for their sound. Those characters actually get um, abbreviated into these one or two stroke abbreviations and now we're strictly talking phonetic. There's no picture anymore. And so even though a few of these, you can kind of see the trace re remnant of how it was a pictogram, it's actually just for the sound. And what you're looking at here is a beautiful little poem called the Iroha, ah uh, in, in, in English script, I-R-O-H-A, the Iroha. And actually the very first uh, three characters are Iroha, which is why they call it that. 
but it's a poem that uses, uh, I forget how many kana there are, but it uses all the kana once in a perfect little poem. That perfect little poem that captures these odd little phonetics, actually the poem and the phonetic writing system is said to have been invented by the Buddhist monk Kukai, this guy. So 774 to 835 CE, the founder of this Shingon or mantra school of Buddhism. It's an esoteric tantric school of Japanese Buddhism. Heavy, heavy emphasis on mantras. In fact, they, they called it the mantra school. They, they used so many mantras. But if you're going to pronounce a mantra, a, a Sanskrit word, if you're going to pronounce it, you got to pronounce it right. In fact, you have to pronounce it exactly right in order for it to have its full power. And so Kukai, who was into this mantra stuff, he goes to China and in 806, he actually brings back Sidham and creates the Kana syllabary. What I'm getting at is that modern Japanese, which is actually a hybrid where if you look at like a Japanese newspaper or a Japanese book, it's actually a bunch of the kanji, a bunch of the characters and the phonetic kana together. It's what makes Japanese so hard to learn because it it's like all of Chinese and let's just throw on a bunch of grammatical rules and phonetics just for fun on top of that. So it's notoriously hard to really learn because it has so many elements to it. But what's fascinating about it is that even though kana, this phonetic thing I'm telling you about, even though it's, it's used as it's the language, it was invented for Buddhist mantras by a Buddhist monk. If, if that's not a cherry on top of a presentation about Buddhism and language, I don't know what it is. So, and the modern arrangement of the Kana syllabary is the same as the Siddham. So there's an intimate connection between Sanskrit and modern Japanese, as crazy as that sounds. So, if you remember, the Chinese had a bunch of two character combinations for the word Dharma. And they came up with you know, uh, these two. Th this was top of the list. This was the damo. Well, in Japanese, these two characters are pronounced daruma. And indeed, daruma is how you say dharma in Japanese. But that's transliterated. That's just the word dharma, right? You could also write daruma in kana. So this is the same thing. And basically what happens in Japan, if you don't know, is that as a, a, in elementary school, or actually even before you go to elementary school, you usually learn the kana first. And so you pronounce things. And then when you go to school, you start learning your kanji and all of that. So I just want you to know that Japanese is also crazy because you can write everything basically two different ways or a combination of both. <laughs> so, so that's Daruma, Japanese for Dharma. That's Damo, Chinese for Dharma. That's our Chol, our Tibetan for Dharma. That's our Siddham, Dharma. Devanagari, Dharma. And then that final or original, I should say, Brahmi script where this all started. Right? where this whole language thing started, our good old Dhamma. And that, my friends, is the, the first attempt at giving this presentation on the languages of Buddhism. <laughs> Yay, wow. <laughs> okay, let me, let me get out of here. Okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I really hope that didn't confuse you 
more than enlighten you in that sense. I really hope there was something there to take away. <laughs> Questions, comments, ideas, epiphanies. Michael, I have a question. I think what struck me the most, and obviously, you know, this is not my area of expertise at all. So, you know, it's like, I think I understood just like, whatever, 30% of it. But I think um, what I found interesting is when you talked about how, and correct me if I'm wrong, but how the Chinese translated Dharma. So this is the, or the Fa or Fe or something oh. like that. Uh -huh which is which means at least what is like law or principle right mm -hmm. and is this what they the chinese used then as to understand dharma that's how it got translated and put into texts or yes now be careful though and and by the way connie you know we're doing, we're talking about language, in language, it's meta crazy here right now. So the Chinese character fa, it means fa. If I needed to translate fa into English, I could translate it as law or principle. So any Chinese reader does not think law or principle, they think fa, and there's a understanding of what that Chinese character means. Right. And actually I wouldn't mind really quickly, let me just bring you back to that really quickly. Go away. Um, where we go? because I wanted to show you something. And that's a great question too, by the way, Connie. Um, where'd you go? Okay, so can you all see the page? Yeah, yeah. okay. So the very bottom, that's the character. It's in modern Mandarin pronounced fa and you might notice if you pay if you caught my little quick Chinese lesson, the radical or the root meaning of this word, it's the little three dots dripping on the side, the little blink, blink, splash. And so actually the root or radical of this character fa is water. The so that's the three little dots. The character next to the three dots. So you get a, it's a left side, right side. The thing that looks like a X or I mean a cross and then the little thing under it, that character, if it were just on its own, just chilling on its own is a character that means to go. Mm -hmm. And so there's a way that you can read mm -hmm. this pictogram as the way water goes and it's within that meta meaning that you could extract these ideas of law or principle method actually is the more like mm, regular way to translate this. But this word or I, this character, God, this so, gets so tricky. This character, if more, it has more or less dominated you know, Chinese in that way where when people see it, it's like, oh, that's Buddhism. That's like, that's Buddhism. That's the Dharma that, or, you know, that not Dharma, but that's the teachings of the Buddha. That's the Fa. So it's tricky. So great question, Connie. So I didn't want to mislead you with that complicated mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, it's just, I was wondering, you know, whenever you translate, you know, texts, I mean, any text, a text, even, you know, the Bible as well, that so much gets lost and uh, misinterpreted. It was just a good reminder for me to what language, how language is limiting at the same time, um, based in time, and then also so conditioned and labeled and with all our concepts that we have and our narrative. So it was just a good reminder. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Great question. Yeah, Tanya. I, so it's kind of two for here. Well, first of all, I think the quickie, what does it say behind you on the 
Uh, it says Jade Palace um, Fortune and Wealth, actually. But I want you to know, I found this for free on the street. <laughs> it, it was on the street with a big sign that said free. And I can read Chinese. And I was like, Jade Hall, Fortune and, and uh, Prosperity. I'll take it. So I don't want you to think I went out and bought something that said Fortune and Prosperity. It just yep. came <laughs> good, 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 good score. Good find. Um, the second question then is, um, you know, through all these translations over like millennium and all that, it kind of makes me think of, you know, that game telephone, you know, where you get like 10 people and you like start out with like some, you know, short sentence, I don't know. And then by the end, like, what does it become? Right. So like, what yep. do we know about, and, and also, and I think Connie was maybe getting at this a little bit too, like well, there's that. And then on top of it, each culture I'm sure is gonna kind of inter inject some of their own sort of spin take on things, right? Indeed, and that's what's so tricky about translation. But when I, I that whole first chunk of, the, of this presentation where I was talking about poly, and I was talking about how the Pali, the language is preserved in all of these different scripts, but it's not translated. It's all just transliterated Pali. And it's one of the reasons why mm, definitely Buddha or uh, Buddhist studies people or historians of Buddhism, it's why we're so interested in Pali is because it's actually seemingly the least corrupted in that way because we just have the poly that goes all the way back and it's carved into stone tablets from like 700. So the telephone game you're referring to doesn't happen so much with poly, but it does happen of course, when things start getting translated. In particular, of course, where you take somebody like me, I translate Buddhist sutras from Chinese into English, but those were already translated from Sanskrit into Chinese. So as a good scholar and translator, I'm referring to the Sanskrit. I'm referring to everything I can to make the best English version, but it's also subject to the telephone game you're talking about. Yep. It's why it's nice to know all this and study it in that way. So you can at least know, well, this might have happened versus there's no way you know that happened or something like that. No. Um, I'm wondering about that question of uh, times and places where people transliterated the Dharma versus translated it and what you think, there may not be one answer, but one thing that might tell us is that they were preserving the trying to preserve the original meaning and and along with that that it's a language for a you know priestly class or for you know a select few and i'm thinking for example about uh i don't know enough about christianity in latin but in but many jews know prayers in hebrew without knowing what they mean like they can say them right so that's a a type of preservation versus a language where we have, where the, so I, I'm, I'm not sure if my question is like, that did it, what does it tell us about a culture that the Dharma was translated to that language? Does, is that, does that tell us that, that it was more widely studied or that enough time passed or, I don't know. That's not really my question. It's a great question, Noam. I'll, the, the best way I think I could answer it, you know, is, you know, I, I, I had a, a few different options for graduate school and what I wanted to study. And I decided that for my master's degree and for my PhD work, that I was really interested in the Chinese um, adoption of Buddhism, like that process of 
of making it their own. And the reason why that is, is because I, I saw even in undergraduate, in undergraduate, when I first started studying Buddhism and particular Chinese Buddhism, I noticed so many relationships between what the Chinese went through during the uh, Sui and Tang dynasty in particular, and what we're going through right now. And so I was like, you know, I want to study and know how they did it and like what happened. Maybe so I would even know like where this is going in a way. I digress. My point is, is that, you know, the, like I, I think I mentioned it briefly, that some of the earliest Chinese translations of Buddhist texts were almost entirely transliterated. No Chinese person could read them. It would be a string of meaningless characters that unless you knew a, the pronunciation of these obscure characters and then could put that together and be like, oh, Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, of course. So in the very early days, it was like 90% transliteration with a couple of Chinese uh, verbs to hold it all together. But then they figured stuff out and they figured stuff out and they find like with Dharma, they eventually figured out their own word for it. We haven't even done that yet. So there, there, that'll be an interesting moment when Dharma gets solidified in a English meaning. It happened in Chinese, right? So even after they established, all right, this is that, this is that, like translating, they still continued to transliterate certain things. That does seem to be because of an understanding that either A, it's untranslatable, or that there's actual mantric power in those words. And so if you translate it, that ain't it. That actually isn't what we're talking about because we're actually talking about Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. So I forget exactly what your question was, but that's sort of along the lines of it. <laughs> so, I forgot my question as well. No uh, then I hope I'd said something interesting at the very least. Question, yeah. Um, hi, um, so I was thinking about several things during this, it was really interesting. It was a lot about language, but I was reflecting on what it was about Buddhism and thinking about the translating of practices between these spaces, right? If you focus on the language and text translations, they're encoding practices, but if you look at some of your other talks, I haven't seen too many of them, but like the one on robes in different places, um, you kind of go, there's something being preserved that's more simple than the meaning of all those words and explanations. It's sort of the practices, right? Like a simple concentration practice or a, or a, or a non-dual practice or so on, right? And in thinking about that, I was wondering whether it's, easier to see that people are actually doing the same thing, or there's only about five things to do at all in mm -hmm. uh, core meditation practices, but there's a lot of flurry of activity sort of in the dress and the mm. decoration of templates and temples and so on, right? Um, and I'm kind of just curious how you would riff on that point and whether when you, um, when you've seen it in these different cultures, you actually triangulate by looking at how the practices translated and how that might have affected, you know, the coding of the text and hmm. so on, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah, great insight. Interesting. Yeah, my only my own only riff on that. My only riff on that is. You know, it's interesting. It's interesting, you know, because it, if you look at the, the, like say, you know, there's this famous story about the a Han, Han Dynasty uh, Chinese emperor who had a dream that he saw the gold Buddha fly through the sky. And so he sent some guys to the, basically down the Silk Road to go find out like what's this gold-faced person I saw flying and they brought back news of the Buddha. And this was supposedly in around the year 50 AD or so. Whether that story is true or not, there's definitely records of Buddhism in China proper 
in the first century of the common era. Then you have a good 300 year period. And what's interesting linguistically relating to this talk and what you're mentioning as far as practices is it's sort of interesting to see which sutras got translated first and then which ones waited for later. And so a lot of the meditation stuff and a lot of the more practice oriented stuff didn't get translated. What did get translated was the more philosophical stuff, the, pran the Pranyaparamita sutras in particular, because the, the Taoist, the, the indigenous Chinese Taoist tradition was very robust at that point philosophically. And a lot of these Buddhist ideas coming in sounded Taoist. And so they were like, ooh. And so the first wave of Buddhism in China, in the Han Dynasty, was this very philosophical type of Buddhism. Also some more devotional type of Buddhism, but that has more to do with the importing of imagery, statues, icons, and things like that. Strictly speaking, linguistics and texts, it's interesting that they gravitated towards the philosophical stuff. And it would actually take a few more hundred years till they got to the more practice stuff. And this is part of my one of my other talks uh, that I gave recently, which is about the uh, arising of Zen or Chan Buddhism in China. It arose like in the you know, fourth, fifth century AD. But it, and it arose as this like wild new form of Buddhism. Yeah, you wouldn't believe it. We just sit there and meditate. It's crazy. Now that of course, that's, that's Buddhism since day one. But because of the choice of translations, these more philosophical texts, the, the Chinese for the most part had not heard much about this meditation stuff. So when Bodhidharma or whoever it was started importing this other type of Buddhism where we sit and watch our breathing, it was like, wow, what is this? So interesting is regarding your, your kind of uh, comment about how the practice and the text kind of meet in that way. So a, a quick point there also about something you said, isn't Dharma an English word by now? I mean, one of the methods of English is to just absorb every word you can find anywhere that a hundred Americans say. Great point. And or, I'm, I'm as a as a Dharma teacher, I'm I I'm a big supporter of that. Pranya, don't translate it. Dharma, don't translate it. Vipassana, don't translate it. Like, let's just get some new words under our belt, <laughs> right? <laughs> Other questions, comments, ideas? Thanks again, Michael. My pleasure. Always entertaining uh, and insightful. Nice. Thank you. Um, my question, we're just talking about Dharma, but I was curious if there were any uh, language battles over the word Dharma, like with the, the Vedas and Upanishads had their form of Dharma versus Buddha Dharma. Was there like that kind of marketing or spin on the Buddha Dharma versus the other Dharma in the language history? That is a great question because of the complexity of this word Dharma and its wide use. That's a really interesting question. And I don't know. I don't know. I've never heard of it. I'm pretty sure that the only Dharma that the Chinese got, for example, was the Buddhist kind. Yeah. Years later, there would eventually be, uh, you know, translations of Bhagavad Gita, Ramayana, and they would have to wrestle with the other Dharma, like the, the Hindu Dharma. But as far as that goes, yeah, there was just one Dharma mm. in that way. But I hear you, it's a complex word. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm just curious, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great question. All right, folks. We are, we're past time, so I'm gonna call it. I wanna thank you all for being uh, the guinea pigs on this new presentation. And again, I hope it wasn't too much or too little. <laughs>